Destiny, a game about slaying monsters, getting loot, and having fun with friends. It's the premier first-person shooter of an era that now sits atop a throne that the studio's previous juggernaut, Halo, forged. But what if I told you, this game was hiding some of the most dark, twisted, and insane mysteries and lore you've ever seen? For those of you that don't know, An Iceberg is a deep dive into the strangest and most interesting lore and mysteries in any universe. But my icebergs are a little different. Instead of just briefly going over each item on a pre-made list, rather, I handpick my favorite bits of lore, quests, theories, and just general world building that I find awesome or crazy. Buckle up. Destiny is host to a lot of interesting and unknown content data mined from the game's internal files. But one of the least well-known and also most creepy examples of this is the crying lady sound discovered in 2020 by Reddit user Relic Terra. This small audio file is nothing more than a presumably older woman crying and whimpering over and over on repeat, but the actual audio itself has a strange and disturbing feel to it that's hard to explain. <laughs> game up to this point and since has the audio file actually been used, which naturally makes us ask the question, what was it originally intended for? Likely it would have been used on a filler NPC in some attack stronghold or human location that has lost a lot of loved ones or friends, but some in the community have even claimed that the sounds of her cries can be seen as Morse code messages with specific references to Rasputin. Could it be that the crying sound effects hold the key to some massive Destiny secrets behind what is really going on? Probably not, but nonetheless, it's one of the least well-known and most intriguing pieces of Destiny lore. Potentially the most terrifying creature in the entire Destiny universe, the Infelion is a monstrous folktale only mentioned briefly in some Awokian Techian dialogue and lore entries. Rumored to be an amalgamation of fundamental forces of nature itself, specifically radiation and blue light, the Infelion kills absolutely anything in its path, leaving no survivors, and even more hauntingly, essentially no evidence that it even was there in the first place. We first see an example of this in a specific lore entry that recounts the finding of a downed Awoken ship presumably attacked by an Infelion. No evidence of hull breach was found. No evidence of Maltech detonation was found. No evidence of hostile alien interference was found. No evidence of internal sabotage was found. No survivors were found. And you see, this creature's convoluted and scary backstory only gets more weird when listening to some of the dialogue sequences when checking out Awoken Techian statues, which for those of you that don't know, are often erected for dead great warriors or people in their culture. The Techians you see here died while they were in trance together. Sometimes when you are in communion, you cannot see what is coming close, like the Ophelion. Their last words were these. First it shimmered, then it crawled, and then it screamed. So while we haven't actually seen an Infelion in-game yet, and have only heard small whispers of them here and there in the lore, the Infelion is most certainly a real entity in the universe, and potentially one of the strongest things we have encountered up to this point. But these mysterious beings are still shrouded in immense secrecy as to even what they are, with some prominent theories maintaining that they could in fact be the same shadow creatures that the RSS Amistris ship came into contact with some point many years ago, which were said to be menacing and otherworldly. We actually have a full black box recording of the ship's run-in with these otherworldly beings too, that can be decoded and says the following. 
information received, considered sober, dependable, not a fantasy, reported a glowing creature on ship moments before NLS jump. Mayday, 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 all stations. This is RSS Amistris. We are under attack. Our hull has been breached. Mayday, mayday, mayday. This is RSS Amistris. Please, someone. I'm an idiot. <laughs> They're screaming. Listen. They're all screaming. Mayday, mayday. This is Ven Asar on the RSS Amistris. We are 300 souls aboard. Something is happening. Everything is blue. Something is here. A Starfleet found that the Amistris was unsafe to board due to radioactive surface contamination. SAR deployed multiple crowd drones for interior survey. Most horrifying of all though, this attack triggered what is known as a Skyshock Alert, which is reserved only for attacks coming from aliens outside of the known systems. So this means that these strange shadow creatures that manage to decimate an entire crew instantly and leave barely no trace, most likely are the same creatures referred to as the Infellion by many ancient Awoken lore texts. And if this is in fact true, that would mean that these monsters are something unlike anything else we have faced. Creatures constructed entirely of primal matter of the universe itself, whose screams are said to strike horror into any living being. At some point in the near future, it's entirely possible that we may find our first real Infellion in-game, and use it to unlock the mysteries of the universe further into deep space than we have ever been. But either way, in even just the short periods in which we have heard about the Infellion and the Shadow Creatures, it truly sounds like one of the most panic-inducing enemies in all of Destiny that almost no one knows about. One of the crowd favorite characters of the entire community in Destiny is Cade 6, and he's hiding one of the most horrifyingly twisted real-world secrets in-game. He's an exo who is vital to the main story and helps you take down many different foes. He was with us during the destruction of the Taken King and helped retake the Lost City. But more than anything, he's known for his bubbly personality and witty quips that made him friends with anyone. And cue the ominous music. Okay, everybody, back in your cages. Sadly though, at the beginning of the Forsaken expansion, Cade 6 was killed. And even more horrifyingly, his ghost Sundance along with him, meaning he was unable to be revived since ghosts are what keep Guardians immortal. This event marked a huge turning point in Destiny, and caused a lot of commotion in the community. And since then though, there's been a lot of very interesting revelations discovered about Cade 6. In the Grimoire Book 3, which is part of a real-world book series and anthology on the lore of Destiny, there's actually a one-page entry with barely any description of Cade 6 looking to a mirror. What makes this entry so special though, is that opposite the mirror isn't Cade 6 exo body, but rather his original human one. Something we have never seen in game before or in any other lore entries. Where this theory gets absolutely insane though, is that that human form in the concept art isn't just a random or generic human body. Rather, it's modeled after a man named Henry C. Jackson. You see, Henry was actually a prominent farmer in the late 1980s based out of Wyoming, who was actually indicted on murder and human sacrifice and cannibalism trials. What he is most well known for though, is the Night of the Black Lambs, where Henry kidnapped 13 of the local children in town and sacrificed them to the, <laughs> I'm just messing with you guys. The picture is real though. For anyone not aware already, Bungie, the studio behind Destiny, originally garnered their fame with a little known game called Halo. For its time, it was one of the biggest shooters in the world, and to this day has an audience with Infinite and the Master Chief Collection. But what you might not know is that Halo is actually a game that exists in the Destiny universe as well. As much as I'd love to stand here and keep you company, I could be playing my favorite video game. Starts with an H. This short clip of Cade, along with countless other in-game references and easter eggs, shows that the characters of Destiny are well accustomed with the world of Halo. However, this realization starts to make us ask a lot of questions. For starters, if the entire Halo universe exists in-game, does that mean that Bungie themselves are canon in Destiny lore too? And if so, does that mean that the same company that made Halo in Destiny also made the game Destiny in the game Destiny? Could it be that the characters we meet and love along our main story journey in Destiny 1 and 2 are actually well aware of themselves as video game characters in some sort of Destiny inception of a game within a game within a game? 
Potentially, this could lend credence to the idea that Destiny is actually taking place in a multiverse, where characters are playing as themselves, playing as themselves in a quantum tunneling set of infinite universes. Or Bungie just likes a game they spent a lot of time on in the past, and I'm obviously looking too deep into this. For the majority of the Destiny player base, the game is less about deep characters and interesting lore, and more about that sweet, sweet loot. Many players spend hours upon hours grinding different raids, dungeons, lost sectors, and the Crucible in order to find the rarest and most sought after guns and armor sets. And it's because of this that Bungie is constantly adding new weapons to the game, many being more rare than the last. But this has led a lot in the community to ask the question, what actually is the rarest weapon in Destiny? A common guess at this is the famed Redrix Claymore, which is an extremely well-known but rare triburst shot high-impact weapon which was originally obtained by reaching the fabled glory rank in competitive crucible matches. This meant in order to get this weapon, a player would need to be one of the best competitive players at the time, which meant it would be harder to get than even weapons that required days of in-game time to grind and get. Currently, the Redrix Claymore is only in about 1.5% of the entire player base's collections, which means it is most definitely one of the most rare guns that Destiny has ever seen. But it isn't actually the rarest. Another recent entry onto that list is the Other Half Legendary Sword, which is known to drop in the Dares of Eternity events, or even more commonly, Treasure Chests in Xur's Treasure Hoard. The weapon itself is the opposing half to a previous drop, called the half Truth Sword, which many in the community assume at some point will be able to combine into what will likely be a nod to the Energy Sword from Halo. The problem is the drop chance on this particular weapon is so amazingly low that just under 1% of the player base even actually has it, which means if this weapon is in fact key to having an Energy Sword from Halo and Destiny, not many players are going to actually experience that in reality. On top of this, many other weapons at some point have been called the rarest weapon in game by many in the community, including the Edge Transit, the Button, the Motion to Compel Scout Rifle, and the Motion to Suppress and Vacate Shotguns and SMGs. And while all of these picks are exceedingly rare and awesome weapons, none are the actual rarest in the entire lineage of Destiny, because that special prize goes to a little known weapon called the Wishbringer. While nowadays the gun has been added via other avenues, its original player base percentage of ownership was only 0.11% and was reserved for only the best crucible players in the world. This energy shotgun was known to pack a punch and while it certainly was never the best gun in the game, it for a period of time would have been the one that made you stand out far more than any other player. But you may still be wondering, is that really the most rare gun in Destiny's history? Well, in terms of readily available ones, yes, but that doesn't mean there isn't something even more ridiculously rare. And the king of this category is the fate of all fools. You see, back in November of 2014, a Reddit user named BKBunny87 made a post about her husband Eric, who had undergone seven brain surgeries in the span of months and was an avid Destiny player that was now losing his memory of loved ones and family. But throughout it all, Destiny had kept him grounded, and he found solace in playing the game in any of his free moments he had, with his wife by his side on her handheld. But now, because of his shallow state, he was having difficulty getting through dungeons and raids. The post blew up, and thousands in the Destiny community banded together to join forces with Eric and helped him beat any content he wanted, especially the newest raids. It's one of the most heartwarming stories in Destiny's entire history, and shows what the game is really all about. Community and it only gets better. The Bungie team had actually gotten wind of the post, and because of how moved they were by Eric's wife posting on the subreddit, they actually sent Eric a new exotic weapon called the Fate of All Fools, which was not released yet in game. Originally planned to be released for the community at large, it was decided that instead, the weapon would remain in the hands of one man only for its entire history, and it is the only weapon in Destiny's history before and up to this point that this has ever happened. Either way, if anything, this story shows us that it isn't about getting the rarest weapons or loot, but the friends you make along the way. And by the way, for those of you wondering, Eric is still alive and kicking today with his happy and loyal wife by his side. The lore of Destiny actually dates back well past what most people are aware of, but the catalyst that kicked off the events most players actually know about in-game is the arrival of the Traveler. 
You see, before The Traveler, humanity and destiny is in what was known as the pre-Golden Age. We were stuck on our home planet of Earth with many wars, overpopulation, and climate issues becoming major problems. There were many space missions going on at the time, but nothing more significant than what we would see in our modern day lives. It was around this time though that humanity noticed a strange object at the edge of our solar system, codenamed Planet X, which traveled between different planets and started to terraform them. Eventually, this Planet X found its way to our neighboring Mars and started to terraform the planet as well, causing massive rainstorms to erupt and life to grow on an otherwise barren rock. This massive sphere was kept a mystery under top secret government programs, where it was now being referred to as the Traveler, but eventually made itself known to humanity and helped us to advance our technology thousands of years forward in an instant building massive megacities in no time with nanotechnology and constructing spaceships like never before seen to travel the stars. This thrust humanity into what was referred to as the Golden Age, where we conquered new planets, built sprawling cities across our solar system, and started to delve into insanely complex and interesting research work for our future of our species. Sadly though, this era didn't last forever. As unbeknownst to humanity, the Traveler actually had an enemy simply referred to as the Darkness, which was making its way towards us. And in one last gambit in order to save humanity from the Darkness that began swallowing everything whole at the edge of the solar system, the Traveler retreated back to Earth and initiated some unknown protocol that banished the Darkness away, but also left the Traveler dormant and now unavailable to aid humanity. This event also caused massive blackouts and famines across the solar system, with many cities immediately being thrust into nuclear winters, where humanity now had to form tribes to survive in the wilderness. It was at this time as well that the ghosts began to emerge from the Traveler and revive dead humans that had perished. These humans were given the powers of the light itself from the Traveler, the same light that had beaten the darkness, and these revived humans were known as the Guardians, the same Guardians we play as in-game. But you see, the most interesting thing about the Traveler is just how little we actually know, because to this day in Destiny, it still isn't even clear what the darkness was and is, and what exactly the light or power the Traveler is harnessed is as well. Why did the Traveler come to our planet in the first place? Why did it help humanity? And even more interestingly, why did it stay and fight the darkness against Earth when we know that the Traveler has abandoned other alien species before? For those that don't know, the Elixni, also referred to as the Fallen, are a common enemy and now sometimes friend we meet in game. But this species of aliens actually met the Traveler before humanity, and just like us, was also given a massive technological boost. But when the darkness came for them, instead of defending them like it did humanity, the Traveler instead abandoned the Elixni and ran away, allowing them to suffer at the peril of the darkness. This is why the Elixni in-game hate the Traveler so much, but it makes us wonder why the Traveler actually decided to save humanity instead. Is there some kind of master plan we aren't yet aware of? Did the Traveler see something in us it hadn't seen in many other species before? After all, even the Hive, another common alien enemy species in-game, millions of years ago, at the time called the Proto-Hive, met the Traveler, but instead was deceived and tricked by the Witness into going into the worm gods on their planet, which was actually the Darkness, to consume the worms that turned their species into an evil onslaught of death. So the Traveler and its power of light and the darkness that opposes it have seemingly been in some sort of battle now for an unimaginable amount of time, and have been involved somehow with every friendly or non-friendly species we meet. What exactly is the Traveler's end goal though? Some in the community as of late actually have begun to speculate that the Traveler in fact may not be a force for good after all. In fact, in the Witch Queen expansion, we even start to unlock the power of the darkness for ourselves as well, and some of our enemies begin to use the light in order to do harm to the galaxy. So could it be that the Traveler and the darkness are not as black and white as we originally thought? Could it be that it's actually more of a yin and yang situation where no one is actually good and evil? And even more so, what actually is the Traveler? How did it get all of this advanced technological prowess that it bestowed upon humanity? Is the Traveler itself some sort of higher consciousness being controlled elsewhere? Some in the Destiny community have even begun to wonder if the Traveler could be the famed sci-fi concept of a Dyson Sphere, coming to our solar system to harness all the power from our sun, after which it would leave us to die, just like the Elixni. 
And these questions only get much weirder when we factor in the super intelligent human artificial intelligence Rasputin and what he has to say on the matter, something we will touch on a lot more later on this list. Either way though, the catalyst for the entire world of Destiny as we know it today is most likely its biggest mystery, a giant sphere hovering over our planet whose intentions we still not are completely aware of, and whose power we truly do not understand. My guess is that something a lot more sinister is at play than we could ever imagine, and something is going to happen with this massive planet X. And luckily, the next two expansions, Lightfall and The Final Shape, are sure to shed more light on this grand conspiracy, so that one day, hopefully, we can all better understand one of Destiny's biggest questions. The Scorn are potentially one of the most terrifying enemies in the entirety of Destiny. Spawned by the darkness itself from the corpses of fallen Elixni, these monstrosities of pure horror are known for their high aggression and lack of free will. For almost the entire time we have been fighting them in-game, they have been thought of as mindless husks devoid of thought and emotion, that simply, like feral animals, are consumed with the bloodshed of all in front of them. But could it be that the Scorn are… evolving? In Destiny 2's Season of the Lost, there was a Shattered Realm event where if the player was paying close attention and watching their step, they were actually able to stumble upon a very peculiar scene. Hidden away in a back room of sorts is a fight club, where the Scorn can be seen huddled around in a circle, cheering on and watching two of their compatriots battle to the death. This is a very concerning revelation because it shows that the Scorn are seemingly beginning to form a sort of culture and brotherhood beyond just pure instincts. Could it be that these lifeless monsters are at an early stage of developing a true culture and identity? It's hard to say because the Scorn on the Glycon still seem very dumb after being killed and revived repeatedly, and only the Scorn we encounter on the shore actually show characteristics of having any sort of higher intelligence. Regardless though, something is beginning to happen with the Scorn that almost no player would have expected, and many don't know about, where one of the most common enemies in the game may be on the verge of becoming something much more terrifying. After all, the only thing worse than a strong enemy is a smart one. Even more horrifying too, if this weird culture of ritualistic fighting and sacrifice is anything to go by, the Scorn may actually be creating a crucible of sorts to practice killing one another to make themselves stronger, just like the Hive was known to do under their feared leader, Kelgaroth. At the end of the day though, this small event makes it pretty clear that at least for the Scorn, there's a lot more than meets the eye. We already know that the ghosts in Destiny play an important role in spreading the ideals of the Light and the Traveler. They fly around Earth and resurrect fallen individuals and bring them back as light bearers or guardians that fight on behalf of the Light against the encroaching darkness. And while it's well known that guardians can resurrect more than just human beings, as we see from some fallen Elixni that have been revived and form a bond with guardians of their own, what a lot of people might not know is that ghosts have revived more than just recently deceased humans. The best example of this, and also the oldest living guardian on record, is a woman known as Senaret. We learn about her in a data entry we can find addressed to Ikora Ray, where Senaret says, I am a low power guardian, very big fanatic of your work as Warlock Caravan Guard. Excuse any male propisms I have raised without knowledge of modern language or devices due to some deficit or otherwise agreeable host. Archaeologists tell me I am female Kadan recovered from a strata of a Mesolaic battle site at Jebel Sabaha in Egypt, and I may be up to 13,000 years old. Perhaps this has caused great stress in the process of my resurrection. Further entries go on to show discussions between Ikora and Sanaret about the nature of darkness and light itself, where our 13,000 year old guardian has some very interesting insights about how the light is much more calm than the darkness that speaks so much thus leading many people to become bored when compared to its talkative and fun dark antagonist. The entries shed a lot of light not only on the nature of the Destiny universe itself, but start to make us ask some bewildering questions, like who else have the ghosts revived? Could ghosts potentially revive some even more ancient humans or other alien species that could give us further clues into the biggest mysteries in the entire Destiny universe? And if they have, where are these other old relics of the past living and hiding? Whether or not this ever turns out to be the case, the peculiar happenstance of Senaret casts a door wide open for some awesome and memorable sci-fi stories of long lost civilizations and humanity's past long forgotten. Sadly though, from what we can tell from all the lore entries and moments in game, 
Ghosts need to find part of the host's body to actually spawn and to start the original resurrection process. Maybe if we want any chance at reviving a creature millions of years old, we're going to have to find a still intact corpse first. The Witness is perhaps the most enigmatic and perplexing mystery that the world of Destiny has ever seen. And lucky for us, many of these mysteries are about to be potentially answered in the upcoming Destiny Lightfall and Final Shape expansions, which will conclude the first major saga in the Destiny universe of the Light vs. the Dark. We first saw the Witness in a final cutscene in the Witch Queen expansion, where the entity can be seen walking in a throne room with a sea of imposing ships behind them. It's in this cutscene that we learn that the Witness is some sort of vessel for the darkness that is hellbent on finding and destroying the Traveler. Because you see, the Witness sees the Traveler, and by extension the spreading of the light, as a problem for the galaxy. The Witness's true goal, as far as we can tell from hundreds of pages of lore documents, is to escape from the mundane prison that is light and dark, and bring on a new and final shape. This is especially interesting considering we know that the final expansion of this storyline in Destiny is called the Final Shape, and it implies that the Witness is about to bring on some sort of downfall or final showdown between the darkness and the light. But why would the Witness want this? We may get an idea when we first encounter the figure in the Black Garden, where the Witness comes to us as a mirror image of our Guardian and promises us salvation. So the Witness is neither a friend or foe, but rather a potential next step to freedom? We also see some logs from Kallus aboard his ship where he has visions of the Black Fleet which is led by the Witness. Kallus exclaims how the fleet swallows all that it comes into contact with, enveloping not only the darkness, but the light as well, leaving nothing but an endless void of blank ephemeral space. So it seems the Witness has a larger goal than we originally thought. The being wants to break free from the shackles that bind the universe together, and through that fire create a salvation where neither the light or the traveler or the horrors of the darkness can have any sway on our destiny. However, it also seems that the Witness has been corrupted by the darkness in some way as well, as we know from Savathun that she was originally tricked by the Witness to obtain a worm from the worm gods for the Hive's survival, because she and the Hive were told that the Traveler above them and the Light was a force for evil, and that they needed to find darkness underground instead. These frail siblings will soon be claimed by the Light, unless we claim them first. We will tell the most cunning sibling of a cataclysm, a prophecy of great loss. We will feed her fear, her pride. We will say, young Sathona, the end is coming. A great cataclysm, a god wave. In the sky, there is only death, but salvation lies in the deep. Lead your sisters down. Your coming will spare their short lives, and you will be reborn, the Witch Queen, Sarah. But who exactly is the Witness anyways? Well, it's been strongly implied by the Destiny team so far that the Witness isn't actually any one entity, 
but rather an amalgamation of many. We can see that in cutscenes with the witness what looks to be many faces extending from their head, and this clue along with countless journal entries heavily imply that the witness is almost similar to the Nine something we'll talk about later on this list, and is a formation of many sets of beings and consciousness to form one being known as The Witness. One journal entry about a run-in with The Witness even states the following, Then saw upon the horizon a wave, and the wave was God, and it approached me, saying, We are as one, you and I. We are gathering of the waters. Gather unto me as they have gathered unto you. We will be as one. The aphid screamed and begged me for salvation. But I was not of them, I was of the wave. The witness may be a combination of all beings and thoughts that it has come into contact with. A scary thought for sure. And as to that mysterious black fleet, well it may be home to an entirely new race of enemies we are about to fight in the final two expansions. After all, there is a very old piece of Destiny concept art where there was a so-called fifth race of baddies which we have yet to see in game. And lo and behold, on that concept art is a sketch of triangular ships and a weird entity that look just like the Witness and the Black Fleet. So clearly the Witness is about to be a catalyst that sets off the final moments of the now almost decade-long first saga of Destiny and its story. But as to what will actually happen, it's anyone's guess. To me, all of the recent lore and expansions have been laying the groundwork that the Traveler and Light may not be good after all, and that the Dark and Light are more of a yin and yang and less good and evil. So maybe the witness is on to something, but has been consumed by the darkness and lost their way. And maybe it will be the job of us as the Guardians to once again restore balance to the universe and stop the bloodshed, but without casting us into an ephemeral hell of nothingness. Whatever it turns out to be though, there truly has never been a more interesting time and moment to step into Destiny lore, as years of hard work and buildup are about to come to fruition, and I can't wait. And if you're watching this video years later after the saga has ended, Hopefully it lived up to everything it could be in this moment here. While Destiny's main narrative focuses on the everlasting struggle between the light and the dark, between the Traveler and the darkness, there are so many other major and interesting lore plots that most people don't know about. And potentially the one that could have the most drastic effects on the universe is that of Siva. Siva and Destiny is a plague-looking swarm of black matter that is actually made up of millions of small nanotech bots that can quickly overwhelm their adversaries and feed off their life force. In fact, it's probably the Siva itself that is what was responsible during the golden age of humanity to build massive cities and ships so quickly. And that's because the swarm of Siva itself is actually able to build things by harnessing matter around them, synthetic and organic alike. And while its origins likely stem somewhat from the Traveler and research at Clovis Bray, the best way we know of Siva in-game is actually the Iron Lords. For those that don't know, the Iron Lords were actually a band of guardians that after the fall, when the Traveler went dormant, were hell-bent on standing up against rogue guardians who, after receiving their power, tried to subjugate humanity instead of protecting them. The Iron Lords were known for being fierce fighters who stood up for what was right, but a horrific incident known as the Siva Crisis is what cast some of them into their demise. Because in the Plaguelands near the Cosmodrome, a band of Iron Lords led by Felwinter at one point traveled to a Siva replication complex where they intended to meet with Rasputin, an ancient and powerful human artificial superintelligence. But upon seeing that they were trying to gain power from Siva for their gain, Rasputin unleashed a massive horde of the plague onto the Iron Lords, killing them all. This also resulted in an entire sect of Fallen trying to become one with the Siva, gaining its power and losing their minds in the process. So it's pretty clear that Siva is a very powerful and godly tool that many different AI try to use at their disposal. But the question of what it actually is, is the most fascinating part. For starters, we know Siva isn't actually a magic spell or plague, but rather nanotech. But from some grimoire entries in game, it also seems that this tech is somewhat sentient itself. In fact, in one log from a lost colony ship, we can see that the AI on board was seemingly dealing with pushback from the Siva itself. I can feel the mites buzzing, pushing against my sub mine. They try to steal fragments of my memory, but I do not let them. They have no will, but they want to be. I exert electronic will, pushing, shaping, forcing stasis on perpetual motion. They are quiet then, but I can still sense them. Where once my cargo holds were full of tools, weapons, and material, now they hold barely contained possibilities. New worlds will be built from these tiny mites, weapons and cities and ships created by thought and science. 
I fear my will is not strong enough to shape these worlds. Only the tyrant can do that. But he will not be a part of my journey. Even his reach has limits. And we will now be nine billion miles away. I whisper my concert to the tyrant in tiny magnetic bursts. He does not listen. The tyrant says take the Siva, and so I take the Siva. The tyrant says go to the stars, and so I go to the stars. So could it be that the Siva itself actually has a mind of its own as well? We know it was originally created in some part due to humanity's brightest minds shrouded in mystery along with the Traveler and other figures. But as to what is really going on behind these tiny nanobots, it's extremely hard to say. Based on that grimoire log though, personally, I wonder if Rasputin could be behind all of this, being the tyrant that this ship's AI is trying to contact. Potentially Rasputin has gained control of this unbelievably powerful nanotechnology that was originally harnessed by human scientists through the help of their studies on the Traveler, and is now using it in an attempt to control all other artificial intelligence in the galaxy, as well as killing any organic foes need be. And even furthermore, could Siva itself be some sort of conjuration of the darkness and energy it inhibits? Could this mean that the Traveler and its mysterious past with the darkness are hiding a lot more than meets the eye? While Siva doesn't play a massive role in every expansion or story beat in Destiny, it certainly is one of the most interesting and thought-provoking side stories in the entire saga. In Destiny, during the golden age of humanity after the Traveler arrived, many new technologies and discoveries were made that helped push humanity into the most prosperous time in their history. And at the center of these research endeavors were the Clovis Bray facilities. Located in the Meridian Bay, Mars, Chicago, and Russia, these facilities were massive and state-of-the-art buildings that delved into the biggest mysteries in the Destiny universe. This included things like interplanetary defense, artificial intelligence, research on the Traveler, and even the creation of new technology like SIVA, transmission augmentation, and even the EXOS. And as with all massive research organizations and video games, not everything that Clovis Bray did was ethical. For example, EXOS, which are actually one of the playable races in Destiny, were designed with the intention of uploading human consciousness into a robotic body in order to give us immortality. But in order to reach this goal, many researchers at Clovis Bray performed heinous experiments on man and machine alike, torturing subjects into submission and trapping them inside early prototype exoskeletons that thrust their minds into madness and many times would result in exploding stomachs and limbs. In some cases, Clovis Bray researchers even injected test subjects with radiolarian fluid, which is Vex mind fluid, which slowly and painfully turns an organism into a Vex drone. Which, for those of you that don't know, is a machine-like race that is another main bad guy that we fight in the games. Clovis Bray were also the main researchers behind the creation of SIVA, which as we already know is one of the most powerful and dangerous nanotechnologies in the universe, and in the wrong hands could spell doom for humanity. But potentially one of the most interesting things that the Clovis Bray researchers worked on was something with their leader Clovis himself, diving into Vex origins and meaning. After secretly stealing Vex research units from the Ishtar Collective, another group we'll talk about later on this list, Clovis and his team started work on creating a portal that would take them to a Forge Star, which was a far away and top secret Vex stronghold which actually turned out to be a Dyson Sphere. Many of the findings the researchers made on the Vex were extremely mysterious and convoluted, and we only have small lore tidbits to go off of regarding what the Vex worlds and megastructures were like through the portal and the Star Forge. Luckily for us though, another research group did even more research on the Vex and made some crazy revelations, which we'll talk about more later on this list. But overall, what made Clovis Bray and the research facilities he founded so interesting though, was their main goal of reaching immortality. While they achieved many scientific breakthroughs, some good and some horrific, their main goal of living forever is one we have seen many scientists or explorers in our real world try to achieve a holy grail of sorts, and seeing how hellbent an organization was on achieving this at any cost is a scary realization for sure, and it makes us wonder what else Clovis Bray has worked on or discovered that we still don't know about. During the golden age of humanity and destiny, many different research organizations and secret military operations were scattered all throughout the solar system, developing some of the coolest and also most horrifying tech our race has ever seen since the Cold Era. One such place of note was the Black Armory. Founded by three noble and rich families, the facility was set up as a contingency plan of sorts. 
The three families believed that there was an extraterrestrial threat that was destined and foretold by ancient scripts to be coming to devour all of humanity. And in order to combat this, the family began to manufacture and stockpile advanced weaponry in the Black Armory in order to defend themselves, all while selling many of these deadly weapons of mass destruction to different shady groups in order to maintain the funding they needed. At the onset of the collapse, though, when the Traveler retreated to Earth to defend the last of humanity, the darkness started to take over the remaining portions of our solar system and this included an attack at the Black Armory. Most terrifying though, we actually have a complete and comprehensive set of journal entries from one of the scientists at the Black Armory, and the story that they tell about the darkness and some of the strange entities within are some of the most bone-chilling in the entire Destiny universe. Here's just a sample of that. Entry 25. We are not alone with the Traveler. Something else has been detected out there, an anomaly of sorts. I'm lucky to have friends in informative places who know things. They don't know what it is, but there is something. Could it be another traveler? Could it be a wonky radio wave? Or something really bad? Either way, we will be prepared. Entry 68. They are here. They are real. I can't believe we were so right and so wrong. To think we could stop this, to say we were naive would be an understatement. We simply didn't know. Their power, their strength, it's insurmountable. There is no more hope, only the screams of humanity. Entry 71. Last night we awoke in the middle of a night to the sound of something pounding on the walls. It roared and stomped and howled in frustration, until it found the doors. They didn't hold. I never saw it. We were too occupied blindly firing around a corner. I just remember the smell of wet earth, and the sound I've never heard before. Like a machine being stretched and then compressed. As to what this monster or monsters are, we still have no idea. But if the description is even remotely true, whatever attacked the Black Army is an amalgamation of complete darkness and damnation that sends shivers down the spines of anything it comes into contact with. One common theory in the Destiny community is that the wet earth monsters, or darkness, could actually be a nightmare or infellion creatures that we see some entries about in the game, but are largely shrouded in mystery. This would make sense considering all of these monsters are described as unstoppable killing machines that slaughter anything in their path. But also is still a possibility that this being that attacked the Black Armory is even further beyond our comprehension. In fact, we even have some old Destiny concept art of a strange monster that we have never seen in game that also fits the description we hear in these journal entries quite well. Either way though, the Black Armory Diary entries in general are some of the most fascinating lore in all of Destiny, and I highly recommend you guys check them out if you enjoyed this theory. The Nine, also known as the Aeneid, are one of the biggest and most discussed overarching mysteries in Destiny. For those of you that don't know, the group is actually named after the Aeneid from Egyptian mythology, who were a group of nine deities that worshipped at the Heliopolis which was the massive and sprawling ancient Egyptian city said to be the seat of worship for the sun god Ra, who, side note, I loved as a kid. Shout out ancient mythology. The nine deities, though, each of who are composed of dark matter, developed cognition and birthed anew after being pulled into loops of antimatter via the force of gravity from each of the planets in our solar system's soul. This means that the Nine's very existence is predicated on the planets they formed around, and each member of the group represents one of the Nine planets in our system. After this formation, the group achieved a sense of omnipotence and immense power that we have only seen in other corporeal beings like the Darkness and the Traveler. As to their main goal though, from what we can tell with communications and lore entries so far, the Nine's main goal is to ensure and sustain their own existence either by protecting the life they depend on, or finding a way to end their reliance on it entirely. And not every member agrees either, as five members of the Nine want to find this salvation in the dark of the light, and four want to find a completely new avenue by abandoning both. But in the meantime, this mysterious league of strangers is hell-bent on finding a way to preserve themselves, and since they can only interact with the dark matter they are composed of, in areas like the otherworldly Jovians, they must use agents and emissaries to impose influence on the world of the living matter in which we live in. We see many examples of this like the Trials of Osiris or the Trials of the Nine, which allows the group to study guardians and their powers of the light as they battle for rewards. We also know that originally the Nine were very interested in studying the Ahamkara monsters for their powerful light abilities, before they were all killed off in the Great Hunt, which greatly angered the Nine. 
Furthermore, we have met beings like the Emissary, who is an agent of the Nine who was previously a guardian, who was kidnapped and is now being used as a way for the Nine to communicate with living beings, along with other characters like the Vendor character, Zer. So the real question then becomes, what are the Nine up to right now? And do they have any plans that involve a larger plot with the light and darkness itself? The questions get even weirder when we mix in other lore texts that imply that some of the Nine may actually be Warmind AI systems, while others may be the concept of fluids and eternity itself. One notable lore text from the game reads, The Nine are survivors of the cis Jovian colonies who made a contract with alien forces to ensure their own survival. The Nine are deep orbit war mines who weathered the collapse in hardened stealth platforms. The Nine are ancient leviathan intelligences from the seas of Europa or the hydrocarbon pits of Titan. The Nine arrived in a mysterious transmission from the direction of the Corona Borealis supercluster. So maybe the story that we originally accepted of the Nine forming near planets from dark matter is only part of the story, as clearly there is something more going on with their origin. And as to how the Nine will come into play in future Destiny content, there are countless ideas. For one, it seems clear that the Nine are also in tune with the light and the dark in some way, and are doing everything they can do to better understand it with some amongst their ranks wanting to control it, and some wanting to get rid of it. This means that whatever will happen in the Final Shape expansion will likely have the Nine involved in a much bigger capacity, and they may even be trying to pit the light and the dark against one another so that they can make an attack when everyone least expects it. The question becomes though, what would an attack like this even look like? And do the Nine have any other ulterior motives we don't know about yet? Seeing as they are seemingly all-powerful beings, there must be more at stake than meets the eye. This is only further exacerbated too by the fact that the Nine seemingly have the ability to predict the future. As we have seen in their prophecy dungeon, which includes symbolic representations of future events such as the rise of Aramis or the disappearance of Io, Mars, Mercury, and Titan following the arrival of the Black Fleet. More than anything though, the Nine are a great example of just how deep the Destiny lore goes, and how many all-powerful and omnipotent beings have a say in where this universe is going. During the Golden Age of Humanity and Destiny, many organizations and large groups of researchers formed massive networks for studying with the main goal of progressing humanity forward. We know of many of these like the Clovis Bray facilities, but another huge player at the time, and actually a rival of Clovis Bray himself, was the Ishtar Collective. Founded on the planet of Venus, the Collective was known mostly for their academy programs, which were schools full of exceptional children and adults looking to get a better grasp and understanding of the universe. But also, and more importantly, their massive research projects and funding into studying Vex ruins on Venus. The Vex, even to this day, are one of the biggest mysteries in all of Destiny, and the Ishtar Collective had a goal of figuring out how this hive mind of sentient machines actually worked, and what their true motives were. This resulted in projects mapping Vex ruins such as the Vault of Glass, as well as many attempts to figure out Vex speech and thought patterns. The most interesting of all of these missions, though, was a project on a Vex designated as Subject 12. Subject 12 was a live specimen of a Vex operation platform that was discovered and immediately a research effort was developed around it, which included some of the Collective's best scientists like Maya Sundaresh and Dr. Shim. Where it started to get crazy, though, was what these researchers discovered. The Vex was running a local simulation independent of the larger Vex network of 227 separate instances of this research going on, and this simulation was predicting everything that the collective researchers were doing to a T. Madness started to break out amongst the group as it became clear to the researchers that if one single Vex was able to simulate and predict their reality so perfectly, who was to say that reality itself wasn't a simulation? We even have records of this time of some of the discussions between Sundaresh and some of the other scientists. Maya, I need your help. I don't know how to fix this. What is it, Kiyoma? Sit. Tell me. I figured out what's happening inside the specimen. I have a working interface with the specimen's internal environment. I can see what it's thinking. In metaphorical terms, of course. The cognitive architectures are so... No. I don't have any kind of epistemology bridge. Are you telling me it's human? A human Merkwelt? Human Qualia? I'm telling you it's full of humans. It's thinking about us. It's simulating us, vividly, elaborately. It's running a spectacularly high fidelity model of a collective research team studying a captive Vex entity. Right now, the simulated Maya Sundares is meeting with the simulated Kiyoma Essie to discuss an unexpected problem. 
There's no divergence? That's impossible. It doesn't have any information. It inferred. It works from what it sees and it infers the rest. I know that feels unlikely, but it obviously has capabilities we don't. It may have breached our shared virtual workspace. The neural links could have given it data. We're inside it. By any reasonable philosophical standard, we are inside the Vex. Unless you take a particularly ruthless approach to the problem of causal forks, yes, they are us. The group became absolutely fixated on this thought of a simulated reality and needed answers. So a plan was devised that would see an ultra-intelligent warmind artificial intelligence Rasputin connect to the Vex network and check himself. And lo and behold, Rasputin was able to connect to the Vex network and determine that the real world was in fact not a simulation. But this only caused further issues for the Ishtar Collective. First of all, Rasputin had now seen and garnered knowledge from one of the most powerful forces in the galaxy, potentially giving him a sense of control and authority that was too much for humanity to deal with. And more immediately, the Collective now had a sense of sorrow on their conscience. Because while their reality was in fact real, the other 227 simulations were so real that it begged the question of whether it was cruel to let the simulated minds suffer in this Vex unit for all of eternity. A vote was taken amongst the scientists and the simulations alike where all parties agreed to join forces together and enter the VEX network itself for further research. Research to this day we still have not learned fully about. Even today, many in the Destiny community speculate as to what the VEX are truly hiding, and if we are missing any key details that the Ishtar Collective has found, as well as what effect the VEX have had on Rasputin himself. Could they potentially have altered the main directive of protecting humanity? And on top of this, the Ishtar Collective is one of our best further looks into the minds of the Vex, who have somehow garnered the ability to see into and model the future itself. If we were able to harness this ability too, could it mean infinite prosperity for humanity? Only time will tell. As you guys already know, for months now I have been looking into theories and lore on tons of massive and recognizable game series, ranging from Elder Scrolls, Elden Ring, and Fallout, to Minecraft, Cyberpunk, and Subnautica. And after countless hours now researching a variety of games and their deepest secrets, I think I may have just found the most insane one yet. You see, back in 2011, two years before Destiny originally released, a video was posted on YouTube by user joyu 7 The video in question titled Letting Go, spans for exactly a minute and contains many strange sounds and symbols along with a handful of disturbing imagery. For anyone that has been on the internet for some time though, you know that unsettling and cryptic videos like this are anything but rare, with entire YouTube channels dedicated to analyzing them. Where this specific story gets crazy though, is just how many weird and coincidental connections it actually makes to the Destiny universe before the Destiny universe even existed. Right at the start we can see the Destiny logo, and while that sounds weird at first considering the game was two years away at this point, it wouldn't have been that hard to fake considering the logo and name were already trademarked at the time and players knew that Bungie's next game after Halo was coming and would be set in a sci-fi universe. Where it starts to get really crazy though, is when we see this strange figure that looks like a puppet of sorts with a body of text beneath. First of all, that puppet figure almost resembles the body of a guardian we find in Glycan in-game, but that isn't enough to go off of on its own. The actual body of text is where we start to find some smoking guns. I used to be so joyful. Once upon a time, no one fought over me. Then the bombs started falling, and the people started dying, and I wept. For the first time, I wept. Now I stand at a precipice. Chained though I may be, I have had an awakening. A light came to me from the darkness. A light that told me I had meaning. I am more than a tool. A sword you wield when you're afraid. I am the eldritch glow that surrounds all things. I am the virgin queen from whom all was born. I am the gear that turns the heart of the nexus. And for the first time in a long time, I am happy. Because I am going to destroy you. All of you. Immediately, this text stands out because it reads as if Rasputin is speaking, or potentially even an entity we haven't spoken to yet, like the Traveler. We can hear that, a light came to me from the darkness, which is exactly what the main themes of Destiny have been about for almost a decade now. And we can also see other peculiar references like, 
I am the virgin queen from whom all was born, which could be a reference to Sabathun the witch queen and the moment in which she spawned the birth of the hive through the worm gods. But even more damning is the line, I am more than a tool, a sword you wield when you're afraid. Because if you recall, the channel that posted this creepy video was called Joyu7. And for those of you that don't know, Joyus is actually the name of Charlemagne's sword that he trusted in battle and won many victories with. Charlemagne was a renowned and great Holy Roman Emperor almost 2,000 years ago in our real world. But even more interestingly, it's also the name of one of the great mega-powerful Warmind AIs in Destiny's lore, which is eventually overtaken and controlled by Rasputin. So could it be that this mysterious video and its creator knew something we didn't? Could it be that this is actually the first piece of content about Destiny and its story and themes ever posted that most people don't know about? Because if that's the case, the other messages in this video about combining into one and bringing upon death would perfectly tie into where the story is currently heading in Destiny and could potentially mean that this video was originally an ARG created by Bungie that was later abandoned or left dormant until sometime in the future. The bad news is, the original poster, as well as Bungie themselves, have come out and said that this post is fake and has nothing to do with the game, so it would seem that the case is closed there. And while that is where I would end most theories, something about this post just feels so off. There are way too many coincidences, including a multitude of other finds, like some in the community who have claimed to decode parts of the ciphertext that list the names of important characters that have died, like Cade 6. And on top of this, the name, themes, and just everything about the video seems almost too perfect or too good to be true. In other strange finds like this for other games I've looked into, there's always an easy explanation the further you look into it, and it seems more and more fake the more research you do. But this is the first time where the deeper you look into this strange video, the more real it seems to become. On top of this, if it really was fake, why has the creator not followed up or made any other strange videos? You would think if you made such a lucky educated guess the first time, you would try and follow it up to gain some amount of fame or notoriety. That is unless that original post you made was part of a marketing campaign you were being paid for. All in all though, the most likely answer is this video is just fake, and the creator happened to make a lot of lucky guesses and creepy coincidences based on knowledge of Bungie's lore structure from their previous games. But if there ever was a strange and disturbing online video that actually turned out to be more than just a hoax, it's this one. The Hive and Destiny are probably the most interesting foe we face, only potentially behind the Vex if we ever do explore and find out more about them. In the Hive's case though, we've actually gotten to see a good amount of backstory and lore unfold in multiple expansions now, most notably the Witch Queen and it's become clear that the Hive are more than just mindless husks. They have their own cultures, writing, speech, and rich and deep history that spans now millions of years of evolution. One of the lesser known and fascinating finds though, is that the Hive actually has a complex and hyper advanced language of their own. Scattered across many of their ruins and outposts, players can find what are called Hive runes that are used by them to communicate amongst one another and even more interestingly, also bring about change in the world. If we have our ghost scan one of the ruins in game, we get a little bit of flavor text on this issue. Hive runes draw their power from a different dimension, where there's no difference between a word and its meaning. When a hive erode the barrier between our dimension and theirs, the rune of death brings literal death. So it seems clear that these symbols in the Hive language, for that matter, have the ability to affect the world in some way, and thus through Hive speech and language, actual and fundamental changes in the universe can occur. And this has led some in the community to make another enticing find. A lot of these Hive symbols in their language have a very similar structure to Fenman diagrams. For those that don't know, Fenman diagrams are an illustration that represent mathematical wave expressions for calculating scattering amplitudes that describe the behavior of subatomic particles. For example, a common diagram to represent Feynman's work is a model of an electron's path as they produce photons that collide with one another. These diagrams are the result of complex and rigid mathematics, but are meant to be an easy to understand function to the universe. At their core, they paint a picture of the fundamental forces at play within our galaxy and are a language of the stars in a way. Taking a closer look at these diagrams though, it becomes increasingly clear that many of the hive symbols we find in game have a very coincidentally similar look. 
Could this mean that this ultra-futuristic language that the Hive have developed that has the power to literally cause death upon its creation is actually nothing more than advanced Feynman diagrams that have unlocked the secrets to our universe? It's a fascinating thing to think about and shows that the Hive and their societal structures and thought processes may not be all that different from humans, after all. Back in Destiny 1, there was a rare Titan exotic called the Ruin Wings, and in their descriptions, players were met with this. In the garden grows a tree of silver wings. The leaves are ruin, the bark disaster, of the seeds we do not speak. And this description left a lot in the community wondering what exactly this tree of silver wings was, as it seemed obvious Bungie was starting to set something big up. And lo and behold, slowly over the years, the tree of silver wings has grown into one of the biggest mysteries in all of Destiny. The puzzle first started heating up in Destiny 2 though, with a new rare armor drop that was housing some new information on the elusive and now famous tree. The tree in the garden with silver wings. The air around it is oppressive and inspires violence in those who even breathe it in. Shards of the disastrous bark peel from it and litter the ground, and nothing grows in its shadow. It scintillates faintly at dusk. It has achieved its entelechy with every body falling every civilization laid to waste, every leaf forged into instrument of ruin. This lore entry made it clear that the Tree of Silver Wings was a force unlike anything we have seen, that was no ally of the light or dark, but rather some sort of amalgamation of both. The tree itself is a catalyst for chaos and violence, and from the sounds of it, inspires death and destruction in its wake. But as to what the tree itself really is, we find more answers in the Unveiling Lore books, which is a set of extensive dives into the creation myths of the Destiny universe. And in one of these novels, we learn about something called the Flower Game, which is said to be an analogy to the origins of life, like Adam and Eve in the Bible. And in this entry, we learn about the Winnower and the Gardener, who are commonly thought to be the Darkness and the Traveler themselves. And here they lay in a garden at the birth of the galaxy. And in this garden, lies a tree of silver wings. So the tree of silver wings then is something that has existed since the dawn of time and destiny, and is seemingly as old and likely as important as good and evil in the universe. We know from some lore entries from Eris as well that a second tree has taken form, and from it the guardians have retrieved a seed of the majestic tree for further study, and this seed will likely be a key lore point to destiny as the story progresses in the future. The seed seems to have properties of both the dark and the light, and it feeds off the energy of wherever it is planted and consumes everything completely, forming into an entirely new tree each time. Even more interestingly too, the tree also bears a striking resemblance to the Lumina weapon in-game, which was said to be a piece of darkness petrified in light, another reference to a being that is a combination of both light and dark. And this is where the really crazy theories start to pop up. Because you see, while we still don't know exactly what the Tree of Silver Wings is, we do have an in-game conspiracy theorist called Ulan Tan who has some interesting things to say. Ulan has been shouting what many in the Destiny community thought was nonsense for some time now, but with each expansion, many of his foreshadowings and fear-mongering of the light and dark being one force and how one cannot exist without the other have slowly been coming true. I propose a simple experiment. Look around. You see light. You see darkness. There could not be one without the other. They are two sides of the same coin. If it is true for those Newtonian echoes, why would it not be true of the purest, paracausal forms? Therefore, I conclude, the reason you persecute me is not because of the symmetry, it's because of the truth beyond the truth, the truth which you most dread. If we could destroy darkness, but we would have to give up our light to do so, how many of us would make that trade? So if these radical thoughts from Ulan are in fact facts, could it be that the Tree of Silver Wings is some sort of parasitic life form that is feeding off the essence of the dark and the light itself? We know from the Destiny creation myths that the world was seemingly set on a path to a final form from its creation, coincidentally the name of the final announced DLC for the first Destiny saga, and this form would likely be one without dark or light. So if Ulan's predictions come true, could defeating the Witness and the Darkness as the Guardians actually also bring about the downfall of the Traveler and the Light as well? And with this downfall, what would actually happen? What or who would fill the vacuum of power that was now evaporated? What if that force was the Tree of Silver Wings? A tree that is harnessing something menacing and horrific inside, as we know from countless lore entries that seem to feed off light and dark, and was a fundamental character from the beginning of time and space in the Destiny universe itself. 
What if the dark and light in the Destiny universe were both actually forces for good in their own way, an analogy to yin and yang on their own, and the true and purest form of evil was actually being held at bay? What if the Tree of Silver Wings was feeding off the forces of light and dark, but in their absence would have to find a new source of food, and in a world without light and dark, the Guardians may be the next best bet? Could the Tree of Silver Wings actually be the catalyst for the next entire saga and decade of destiny that was hiding in plain sight the whole time? Time will tell for sure, but either way, the Tree of Silver Wings is truly one of the most bewildering pieces of lore in the entire Destiny universe. It should be clear by now that the golden age of humanity and Destiny marks some of the most prosperous times our species has ever seen. For the first time, we conquered the stars, built massive structures we only could dream of before, and entered into a new dawn of human evolution thanks to the arrival of the Traveler. But along with these advancements came many military operations as well. And one of the most effectual of all of these was the development of a super machine artificial intelligence codenamed Rasputin. Originally developed in a top secret Clovis Bray research facility, Rasputin was birthed with the specific intention of protecting humanity at all costs. His prime directive as a machine was to ensure the survival of the human race no matter what it took, and thus Rasputin was given express control of many high-grade military munitions and fissile material. But the most interesting part about Rasputin was just how advanced he was. At some point during his development, Rasputin's codebase became so complex that even his creators lost a fundamental understanding of him, and Rasputin even began to develop himself further as well, a machine making a machine. And this extraordinary mind that was Rasputin was only given more power and free will because of many risky decisions the engineers on the project made to give Rasputin less barriers. Here's just one of the many entries in game from his creation that proves this point. The engineers of Clovis Bray conceived a solution during the development of our War Mind project. By relegating ethical decision making to a black box morality system, the War Mind instruments its own proprietary virtual quantifiers incomprehensible to even its own creators. Rasputin determines morality on its own terms, and by design we are blind to that process in order to preserve its objectivity. Rasputin in many ways was the greatest and most advanced creation in humanity's history, and that gambit, well, it ended up paying off because Rasputin was what actually originally detected the darkness at the edge of the solar system that was making its way to Earth due to the Traveler's presence. The only reason we even had the forewarning and foresight we did about the coming doom was directly through Rasputin's actions. But after detecting the darkness, something unbelievable happened. Rasputin ran countless simulations and determined in every circumstance there was a 100% chance that humanity was doomed to become extinct in the coming Armageddon. So Rasputin did the unthinkable. He took immediate control of the majority of humanity's advanced weapon systems across every planet, and implemented and initiated his own protocol codenamed Midnight Exigent. In an instant, Rasputin abandoned his prime directive to protect humanity and instead went dark, sending himself and all forces including the other less powerful war minds under his control into a complete blackout so that humanity had no control of the systems. This resulted in countless human lives lost as the darkness began its slow invasion into the solar system. And unbeknownst to the other war minds, in the now dark state, Rasputin was devising another insane idea, called the Abhorrent Imperative. Because Rasputin had determined there was no way to conventionally save humanity, this imperative was a last ditch effort that was devised should humanity ever be threatened by extinction. Rasputin would fire all weaponry at the Traveler, thus forcing it to stay and defend Earth against the darkness, instead of leaving us like the Traveler did to so many past civilizations like the Elixni. The thing is, in Destiny's lore, it's widely assumed that this abhorrent imperative never actually took place. Instead, the Traveler decommissioned itself in order to push the darkness back. But what if that wasn't the case? What if this insane plan hatched by Rasputin did in fact occur, and the Traveler is only still sitting over Earth because Rasputin himself fired upon it. After all, we know from many lore entries in game that there was a massive and blinding flash before the Traveler turned off, and no one knows what it actually was. This would mean that the biggest event in the Destiny universe so far was actually the result not of some mysterious forces of light and dark, but rather the most intelligent artificial intelligence humanity has ever made. Could it be that Rasputin discovered something we don't know about, or has a plan so big and with so many moving pieces that everything we are experiencing is actually a plan of his own devices? 
You see, Rasputin has more than just smarts as well. We know he has control of Siva, for example, which he unleashed on the Iron Lords, and we also know he has interfaced with some of the most ancient and intelligent beings in the universe, like the Vex. And keep in mind, the Vex are known for their ability to predict and model the future perfectly. Surely Rasputin could have achieved this ability as well. So could it be that Rasputin is building an entire model of the universe in his head, and has determined that there is only one single option to preserve the human species, the journey we are going on now in Destiny? Something surely is up with Rasputin, but the scariest part is we don't know what this means. After all, we can even clearly see from other war minds that Rasputin is something different at this point, something completely outside the realm of even just a machine. In many lore entries all over the game, we hear about how there is one robot that is different than the others, like the Sun Death Shotgun's lore tab, which reads, You spoke with the Deep Orbit Minds. We heard what you asked, but they had questions too. The lying robot no longer lies with others. Where is he? This small lore entry is likely a conversation between the Nine and an unknown set of entities called the Deep Minds, who are seemingly holding immense power. So it is especially concerning that even the most powerful forces in the galaxy, like the Light and the Traveler, the Darkness, the Nine, and now the Deep Orbit Mines, all have a huge concern with Rasputin. Could it be that the biggest threat all along isn't something outside the Milky Way or another alien species out to harm us, but rather a man-made machine that was meant to do nothing but protect us? The scariest revelation of all is that Rasputin may have determined the only way to save humanity is to destroy them. Either way though, Rasputin knows more about what is really going on than we could ever imagine, and my guess is he is about to play a very pivotal role in the content we will see in Destiny for the next decade. You know, Destiny never really had a main character. Technically in lore you are a guardian just like all the others, and while there are influential figures, no one is at the center of everything. Except for maybe Rasputin a being beyond our wildest conception that may just be the crux of everything in the Destiny universe. And as always, thank you guys so much for watching and hopefully you enjoyed all these theories here. Destiny really does have some of the most fascinating and deep lore I have looked into so far. So much so that I couldn't even fit everything I wanted to into this one video, otherwise it would have been over three hours. But let me know down below in the comment section too what game series you guys want to see next and what deep dives you guys want me to get into. And feel free to also check out the Discord link in the description to join the community there and talk about game theories and lore that you love, as well as just help me with upcoming projects if you're interested, or just swing by every single weekend right here to hang out on stream and say hi. Thanks again guys, and until next time.